anyway, look, today we have Thomas Joseph Brown with us. Um, quite simply, Thomas is one of the smartest most brilliant people that I have ever met. In fact, as I made a little joke about on my Facebook page, I need an encyclopedia and a dictionary just to really begin to understand what he's telling me sometimes because his mind is just so incredibly amazing. But what he has done is he has come up with um, an amazing talk with, for us today and I have seen this, you know, kind of the beginning of the slides of this, so I'm very, very excited. Thomas, why don't you introduce yourself so that people can know a little bit more about what you do and what you have been done, doing, <laughs> what you've done and what you've been doing so that they know a little bit more about you. Oh, well, thank you, Bernice. First of all, I'm actually honored that you asked me to be amongst some of these incredible luminaries that you've had on this series. And I'm not sure I'm worthy of that introduction you gave me. People have hands like the smartest guy I've ever met. I'm going, oh, shit, I gotta like put up with that now. Um, <laughs> now I gotta pretend like I am. Um, I know some real smart people, and I've had some wonderful mentors through life, and I've uh, been very fortunate for some of that to have rubbed off on me. Um, so, yeah, basically right now, I'm in Bali, uh, basically pretty much just researching a variety of subjects and just trying to think out a new phase in life. I've been through a lot of different phases. In the past, I ran Borderland Sciences Research Foundation in 1985 to 1995, published the Journal of Borderland Research. So I've been exposed to a wide variety of um, very far out ideas, many of them conflicting, and also able to work with a lot of different um, inventors, philosophers, thinkers, and really start getting a feeling of the uniqueness of each one. Now, each one almost has their own universe, the way they connect in, but yet there's common archetypal structures throughout. So my interest has really been in finding the pure form archetypal structures, sort of sifting through all the different um, arenas of thought, philosophy, religion, science, and see if there is a common structural element through it all, which, to my satisfaction, I've found, but it may not resonate with others. So everything's a personal journey. This one is mine. And that is actually really quite an achievement, isn't it? To be able to boil everything down to an archetypal structure. And um, I know that you've been Gun to explain that to me, and I really look forward to when we have a little bit more time to sit down and really get the gist of that. But um, that's quite an accomplishment, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm. Yes, yes. So, I mean, basically, you know, I look at what I'm doing as symbolic performance art. You know, I had to find a category to put it into, so I had to make up a new one. You know, it's really more pragmatic metaphysics. You know, I love so that. Really what we're going to get, I'll tell you, we'll get a, like this overview of, you know, diverse scientific data and ideas, you know, leading to a natural scientific approach to uh, art, culture, and nature. Because I've looked, and um, you know, so much work, I mean, I've seen a couple of the speakers down here say how they were um, very inspired by the original magical Egypt, which I really loved. And uh, we'll discuss some of that as we go through. I mean, I've been reading this stuff since I was a teenager. You know, I had uh, Budge's uh, Egyptian Book of the Dead when I was probably 15 or something like that. I was going through those and trying to visualize going through the pylons and reading uh, Evan Wentz's translation of the Book of the Dead and trying to visualize that. So I've, I've always been trying to work out these visual paths through things. And that was before I knew about the archaeoastronomy, I you know certain things that pyramids aligned to true north, but then we start finding out these extremely complex, um, yeah, I was watching that Nightingale's talk, I was going, wow, you know, just the, the total complexity that's within some of these alignments, and it's, it's multidimensional, without a doubt, but what's the reason for it? Why were they doing this? You know, what were they connecting with? And really, that's been one of the questions in my mind is, you know, it's not like we're just in some empty, empty 3D space where everything goes up into nowhere and everything's made out of little electrical particles because some guy thought that up and they smash them in machines. Um, and everybody thinks that that's what everything's made out of. And they did pop a champagne when they make higher energy things pop out new ones like they figured something out. Um, yeah, I'd take a different approach to it all. 
So, <laughs> well, sweetie, why anyway, don't, so, yeah, why don't we start when you're so ready? Because, this, you know, this talk's just really just a presentation of um, a range of ideas leading to that greater understanding, sort of like, we say an impressionist painting is a bunch of little dots and you stand back and you look up close, it just looks like dots, but you stand back and you go, okay, there's some interesting ideas here to consider, you know, and um, it says throwing around for people to check out for themselves and um, create a wider dialogue. I have to say, when you showed it to me, it's something that really shifted my understanding because the question that you raised, which is why did they do these things? I mean, it really is a kind of a, a question that looms so huge because there was so much effort that went into the construction of these things. And really in a very tangible sense, you are the first person to begin to answer that for me. And that's why I'm really excited about this talk. So thank you. Oh. Thank you for being part of the symposium, my love. No, no, it's great. I haven't done anything like this for a while, so it's, um, yeah, thanks for dusting me off and pulling me out of the closet. <laughs> my pleasure. Well, I will turn off my camera so that people can concentrate on you, but I'm here watching, so if you need me, just... Yeah, and, and yeah, you and Chance, you have, if you have any questions as we roll through, feel free. Okay, I'll tell you what, we'll turn on our cameras if we have questions so that you can see us. All right. Fantastic. Sounds good. All right, take it away, guys. Take it away and enjoy it, guys. This is going to be amazing. Okay, so let's go on a trip. You know, let's say you want to attain knowledge of the higher reality behind this reality, such as, you know, the Gnostic Pleroma. That's one I like to use, a formless creative void behind the veil, you know, home of the Gnostic aeons, the creative aeon, which, you know, the, gave birth to us and where we're at. So, you know, so perhaps we can transcend the subjective objective consciousness by a cognizing archetypal foundations of manifestation as they express themselves in forms and energies. So like our brains are attenuators, um, you know, they limit input to allow basic functions. You know, we can't process, we find this from neurological studies. So, you know, we need to train our minds to see things in themselves as expressions of primary ideations or archetypes. That's uh, what Steiner pointed out was Gert the Gertian method, you know, which is based on polarity and metamorphoses, which we'll touch on a bit in this talk. So we have, you know, basically the classic hermetic axiom, as above, so below. But we'll look into this in a deeper sense. I mean, here we can see logarithmic spirals in galaxies and hurricanes. You know, the sacred geometry appears everywhere, you know, almost like from the Platonic realm that you know, to me, that's the real nature of space, not the three-dimensional coordinate system that we project or experience, but that there's this actual fundamental realm. And this gets into the concept of anamnesis, right? The remembering of something from previous existences. And, and, and some take this as perhaps a remembrance from previous lives, which I'm sure from experiential and iner initiatory processes that this would be true, but also I think it means that there's like a pure realm from whence we came. You know, what you know, like I say, well, when a baby's born, is it born as a clean slate, or is there some underlying something there? And in that sense, perhaps these uh, the, the sacred geometry is that nature or the expression of that nature on our plane. We could look at it too, you know, as without, so within, and as without. As an example, we take a look at Kepler's Music of the Spheres, um, the sacred geometric relationship of the planets. And what we see on the right here, <coughs> excuse me, the atomic nuclear structure hypothesized by Dr. Robert J. Moon, 1986, where protons are considered to be located at the vertices of a nested structure of four of the five platonic solids. So, and this is one, um, model using the platonic solids. It's also the structured atomic model um, using the platonic solids. So, you know, that's an FPS quantum model. In fact, the quantum model's been um, uh, falsified. Eric Ryder, the thresh thresholdmodel.com, you can look it up. Um, there's a number of people, there's a lot of intellectual ferment around this. So, you know, a lot of people just accept, well, science figured this out, they smashed these particles, they thought it out, everything's made out of this. 
but there's a lot of people countering that, so it's really wonderful to see what all the uh, different intellects are thinking. And also, etherealmatters.org, that's the structural atomic model where they're developing a model with no neutrons, right? There's just two ways that the electron interacts with the proton, which actually makes a lot more sense in that. Um, but I'd like to actually read a little thing here from the Philosophy of Physical Science by Sir Arthur Eddington. I'll quote, the question I'm going to raise is, however, how much do we discover and how much do we manufacture by our experiments? When the late Lord Rutherford showed us the atomic nucleus, did he find it or did he make it? It will not affect our admiration of his achievement either way, only we should rather like to know which he did. The question is one that scarcely admits of a definite answer. It turns on a matter of expression, like the question of whether the spectroscope finds or whether it makes the green color which it shows us. But since most people are probably under the impression that Rutherford found the atomic nucleus, I will make myself advocate for the view that he made it. The tendency of writers on quantum theory has been to go farther than I do in emphasizing the physical interference of our experiment with the objects we study. It is said that the experiment puts the atoms of the radiation whose characteristics we measure. I shall call this the Procrustean treatment. Procrustus, you will remember, stretched or chopped down his guest to fit the bed he had constructed. But perhaps you have not heard the rest of the story. He measured them up before they left the next morning and wrote a learned paper on the uniformity of the stature of travelers for the Anthropological Society of Attica, end quote. What I think is saying is, we don't know. The, the subatomic model, is it created by our experiments? Is it really what's in there? What, you know, there's a lot of people accept stuff, but you know, what uh, Steiner and Ernst Lairs and stuff called, you know, the you know, self-deception of the discursive mind. So we look at matters, information, precipitate of consciousness in life. And to quote um, Baron von Herzl, what lives may die, but nothing is created dead. So let's look at stars, panpsychism. This is Greg Matloff's work. So, and the pan, his form of panpsychism conceives that the universe is in some sense conscious and that a portion of stellar motion is volitional as an alternative to dark matter. And he raises the concepts in Star Maker, Ola Stapleton's great book. So a universal proto-consciousness field congruent with vacuum fluctuations could interact with molecules via the contribution of the Casimir effect to molecular bonds. Spectral signatures of cooler stars, such as the sun, reveal the presence of simple molecules. Cooler stars move somewhat faster around the galactic center than their hotter sisters. This velocity difference, called Perinago's discontinuity, occurs in the stellar temperature distribution where molecular spectral lines become apparent. Panpsychism can possibly emerge from philosophy to become a subdivision of observational astrophysics. So what he's saying is basically when the stars start manufacturing heavier elements, then they start moving differently, that they start connecting to this proto-consciousness field. And we say, was well, the sun conscious? I mean, there's different things, which is not much scientific papers, but it's been noticed by a lot of observers um, in the last couple of solar cycles, the earth facing quiet, you know, the sun's like putting out these big flares, giant, you know, sunspot groups. It turns towards the earth, they're slowing down. And so there's something, you know, there's evidence that the sun is actually protecting the earth during this. And then we also have Stuart Hameroff, uh, you know, he's a professor of anesthesiology and psychology um, in Tucson. And, you know, he's very much looking at quant, you know, consciousness through these microtubules in the brain, maybe going with, you know, the subfield. So, um, I mean, basically stars aren't nuclear furnaces, you know, that's really a joke of a model because nothing fits the observation, nothing between them. <laughs> um, you have people like uh, Professor Pierre-Marie Robitaille who developed the first uh, high resolution uh, magnetic resonance imaging stuff and his Sky Scholar YouTube channel, he's been a series of wonderful videos on the sun as metallic hydrogen, at which somewhat merges with the electric universe models. But we could go on, this is a whole other lecture in itself. I just want to put some of these ideas out there. So sun's conscious, we're connected. Alexander Chajewski, father of heliobiology, sun's effect on biology, founded aeroionization. Ionization effects on biology. 
So he researched the impact of variations of solar activity and dependent geomagnetic oscillations on epidemic diseases, mortality rates, and human mental conditions. Suggested mass changes of mind and populations are triggered by changes in solar magnetism manifesting as upheavals, revolts, wars, and revolutions as well as events such as epidemics, infestations, and accidents. More than three quarters of all instances of human unrest, including the Russian Revolution of 1917, had occurred during a solar maximum. Our dependence upon the cosmic pulse of the sun might be mediated by ions or excess changes in the air. So this leads on some very interesting research. You know, here we have um, historic statistical solar activity, you know, acts as accelerator and moderator on the whole biosphere. The freak, you know, he showed frequency and magnitude of population growth and decline, birth and death rates, harvests, heart attacks, and crashes, deaths, trees, suicides. They're all a reaction of the planet to the electromagnetic corona of the sun. And now, Chujewski, he studied data from 72 countries from 600 BC onwards. But he also, this air ionization, he thought it had something to do with ionization. He found out, I, I never knew this, I thought I was researching his work, but you can suffocate in a pure oxygen uh, sort of environment if there's not enough um, negative ionization in it. Wow. You know, at least like 1,000 ion per cubic millimeter or something. You know, so if the, if the net concentration of positive ionize, ions are too high, you, you suffocate. So he felt that this really had a, a lot to do with that. And he invented what we call a Jajewski chandelier, right? <laughs> so there's some interesting little sidelines of this. And this chart here- Can I ask you, right. Thomas, does this sure, correlate- because this correlated all to astrology as well, or is this just the sun and the ionization? I mean, is there any uh, relationship to aspects or planetary aspects as well? It has to be directly related. Because okay. uh, even RCA was doing radio astronomy in like the 50s. John, uh, what was his name? I can't think of the guy's name right off. But he did a lot of papers on radio, radio astronomy, really radio astrology, because then they could predict, of course, this was, they were just heliocentric. Um, pretty much because they're looking at what effects the planets might have on the sun to create, you know, sunspot activity, things like that, which would create radio propagation because they had to deal with, you know, the, you know, the uh, global uh, shortwave broadcast systems. So, yeah, they were very much interested in it. And, of course, it can be directly tied in. Um, and we'll see some other things that, as we go along, which will further confirm this line of thought. So, yeah, this is just showing that these cycles are there. We don't need to go too much into analyze them because there's more evidence of that. So what we'll look at here is, um, here we see sort of the relationship of floral and faunal growth to years of sunspot maxima and minima. It's quite interesting to see the inverse relationship between them. This is out of an old book on the sun by a man named Stetson. I've scanned these years ago. I've been looking for the book again. Um, and on the right is actually from uh, George Slikowski's work on who developed the multiple wave oscillator, you know, a lot of electrotherapeutic, but he was very much interested in cosmic energies and earth energies. And, and here they were basically mapping out the qualities of wines against, um, you know, the fine wines were during the peaks of uh, sunspot maxima. So clearly this stuff's integrated totally into the biological cycles, you know, and human activity. So we're connected in. And this is from the Soviet heliobiology work as outgrowth of Chujewski's work. And we'll see upper right, dynamics of morbidity with scarlet fever in Leningrad and curve of solar activity. Well, there you go, um, viral diseases. So the next one over to the right, more dynamics of morbidity with polio in Japan and varieties of planetary index of magnetic disturbance. So it's not just the solar activity, but it's also its reaction on the earth, right? And in the lower left, number of deaths to cholera, you know, and mean curve of wolf numbers for same year. So wolf numbers is sunspot count. So the sunspot count is naturally related to the solar activity, you know, the flares. <clears throat> and then we see morbidity with scarlet fever in different geographic latitudes. So it depends on where earth you are, how, how the energies are coming in. So, um, and what, so what's interesting, I mean, it's a pretty direct correlation here. Ultraviolet wavelengths are from 10 nanometers to 400 nanometers. So most viruses vary in diameter from 20 nanometers to 400 nanometers. So basically, when the sun's flaring in the extreme ultraviolet, 
people are getting viruses. And you know, we got more viruses in our body than bacteria. Viruses are essential to human propagation. Uh, the fertilized egg can't stick to the womb wall without a specific retrovirus in the system. And, and all that junk DNA is virus, ancient virus stuff. Um, yeah, Professor Louis Villarreal up at the viral department at UC Irvine, he's doing some fantastic work along these lines. But um, yeah, so what happens is when, you know, the flare changes, if our system's out of uh, shape, then potentially, you know, what's in our system changes to a pleomorphic form. So these direct effects of the solar flares on, you know, life and death rates within. And then we have uh, John Eddy, solar astronomer, um, and he is... Um, Hey, can uh, I just stop you one. and go back to that one slide, though, for a second? Basically, what you're saying, oh, <laughs> what you're saying is that a plague might not be a plague unless there is the right solar aspect for it. Correct. That's kind of the point you're well, making. Well, they basically graft against them. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, that's what they're all directly tied in. And also what's interesting is tied in, and we'll get into this a little bit, is, you know, uh, we call it um, economic cycles, but we know they're manipulated too. So somebody's out watching this stuff and somebody knows this stuff, they just don't tell us. John Eddy, solar astronomer, expert in the history of solar processes, right? So in historical times, sun underwent ex extended periods of missing spots, we call anomalous magnetic respite. The sun during its 11 year cycles affects mental processes and long-term drastic changes could give rise to even more marked oscillations of mental life on earth. Bursts of cultural activity in its broadest sense might be expected in independent societies. The strongest changes in cultural history occurred during the so-called bounder minimum around AD 1645 to 1750 when solar activity was essentially switched off. 1600s to 1700s, it was the age of enlightenment, scientific discoveries leading to our modern world. If we look at this chart here, we see to the uh, the spore minimum was pretty much the Renaissance. Um, so, yeah, here we're just pretty much just seeing that, you know, basically the flow of civilization is tied in to. Um, if you want to know about astrology? The whole thing is tied into this, and we're just looking at the sun so far. Uh, so we're just going to paint a picture of all these different ideas and go through. And one thing is interesting, <clears throat> see, because when the spore minimum, when that started, I mean, what we have there was the, um, you know, the great Renaissance, Galileo, you know, all the discursive sciences are arising. You know, before that, for like four or 500 years before that, they're building all these Gothic cathedrals, you know, dedicated to the Virgin Mary. And, you know, and then they start the, um, you know, this gr great, you know, rise, the, the uh, what we call the Renaissance, and what they do, they start like burning witches, the Inquisition. It's like something wrong. See, so people think about that. The thread that now leads to quantum theory and the belief that that's the fundamental nature includes the witch burnings. People need to consider that in their processes. People are so integrated and believe what science says. And you find this with a lot of researchers, and you know, you have great respect, they'll have great insight into one area, but then they accept every other area as the same rather than like transforming the entire vision. So that's a process we hope to work on here. We have so an inverse relationship me. between plants and bunnies, right? Um, in the respect that you have a solar min maximum, I think, and the plants are really big and the bunnies are really small. So in terms of laws and witch burning, are we reacting to a solar minimum or a solar maximum? What is the most deleterious to us as humanity? Um, well, it seems that, yeah, the solar maximums was more activity and things, but the solar minimum is sort of when the uh, great, um, uh, what we call it, uh, ideas arose. But at the same time, those ideas have always been sort of countered in many ways, what Steiner called the anti-evolutionary element, which he never really defined, or at least I've never found the definition because I never read through all his volumes of stuff. I just went through this, a lot of scientific data. This is actually um, Ray Tome, Cycles Research Institute. You know, um, and we don't have to go through detail of all this because this, we could take hours on this stuff. And um, I'm just trying to give the idea. So different types of radiation vary over sunspot cycle. Continuous stream of radiation, solar wind arrives at Earth. Fluctuations in the stream 
at Earth affects the Earth's geomagnetic field. So Schumann oscill resonance oscillates to 7.5 times per second, it's 7.83, but it's approximately around there. You know, this is how fast electromagnetic waves travel around Earth. So that's the speed of light. If you could run light around Earth, it, it would make one, uh, it would go 7.83 times or seven and a half times in one second. That's, of course, the speed of light is not really the speed of light. That's the, uh, that, that's a constant, uh, I mean, it's been buried all over, but it, it's a general constant term for figuring things. It's the speed of the wave front in terrestrial conditions, so it's a constant, but we can, once the wave front's established, we've got no way of measuring the speed. And, um, yeah, you know, and we can never measure a ray. It's always group velocity. So there's a few problems with the speed of light thing too. But um, anyway, in general, speed of the wave front. So anyway, bursts of solar ra radiation can get the Schumann resonance really ringing. There are oscillations at near multiples of this, 15, 22.5, 30 hertz, and sometimes lower frequencies. So human brainwave frequencies that are commonly studied over the range from about 0.3 to 40 and the Schumann resonance is right in the middle of that range. The brain is largely electrical organ. Outside EM fields can affect the brain by entrainment or in other ways. For example, it's known that 10 hertz cycle waves will make human reaction times faster while three cycle waves will slow it down. Accidents are more frequent when there are strong ELF or ultra ULF waves such as three cycles resulting from a slowing down of human reaction times. People are less able to deal with tripping up or sudden events and more likely to have an accident. I'd actually like to read a quote from Tesla here that I found I uh, like. Sure. This is the quote. Alpha waves in the human brain are between six and eight hertz. The wave frequency of the human cavity resonates between six and eight hertz. All biological systems operate in the same frequency range. The human brain's alpha waves function in this range and the electrical resonance of the earth is between six and eight hertz. Thus, our entire biological system, the brain and the earth itself, work on the same frequencies. If we can control that resonant system electronically, we can directly control the entire mental system of mankind. Thomas, yeah. Ellen is asking a very pertinent question about that. Is there a way that we can actually protect ourselves from being controlled in this manner? Um, well, it's a good question. And a lot of people are working on a wide range. Um, I'd like to think of it in a sort of methodology of uh, Mantec Chia in the you know, Taoist meditation. It says when you get the microcosmic orbit going and you seal your system up and you awaken like all of inner planets, your astrology no longer affects you. You've now control of your whole spiritual destiny. And maybe, you know, this is the thing. And this is, we look at like the terrain theory versus the germ theory. Terrain theory is the, the energetic thing changes, the terrain changes, the Soviet heliobiology research on you know, uh, extreme ultraviolet flaring and viral disease waves show exactly. I mean, people didn't die. You know, people, some people got it, some people didn't. What actually is that within our systems that can hold it off? Do, do we have the power ourselves? And, you know, and, wh and why were people building big, beautiful temples and things like that, connecting up to all these things? You know, with, were, were they some sort of filters, purifiers, even more? We'll get, We'll carry on here. But anyway, <laughs> there's so much of this information out there. There we go. Um, one of my favorite guys, uh, Professor Giorgio Picardi. He was one of the most the chemist of the sun, you know, controversial, significant Italian scientist of the 50s and 60s. So he was the chemistry chair at the University of Florence. And it's interesting, you read up on him and they go, oh, you know, science, you know, orthodox science don't like this. They pick it as statistical analysis. And then they, they say, but he was a man of impeccable character. You know, he's like one of the finest people you'll ever meet, but we don't trust his data, you know, because <laughs> it doesn't fit the paradigm. Um, I just love those sorts of approaches. Um, so anyway, he discovered what we call the Picardi effect in which interplanetary magnetic fields influence the result of simple inorganic reactions and in general results of non-reproducible phenomena. You know. So what he was working with, the precipitation of uh, bismuth oxychloride. Um, so basically, you know, bismuth chloride, water, and you get this bismuth oxychloride precipitate colloidal solution. He timed it <clears throat> over a couple decades, um, nine years of good data, 
And what we look at the center chart here, correlation between two different chemical tests, F and D, which is just basically water and then water with the um, surface tension reduced through mercury bulb technology, um, which is actually old stuff used for descaling, you know, water heaters and things. Um, so yeah, so basically we're looking at time across the bottom, solar rotations and the effects. So the time, because this is in industrial chemistry, right? In pharmaceutical chemistry, sometimes the reactions don't work right, right? And you have complex reactions, you know, with extremely expensive ingredients. And then all of a sudden, you, um, yeah, things don't work. How come? So that's what they were investigating, if there was any sort of geocosmic relations. And they did. So they found, you know, basically between solar rotation and uh, geomagnetic and solar days, I mean, what we call solar flare days, but also an upper right, correlation between blood sedimentation and chemical test P. So what they found, too, is, is that they were basically doing a blood, chicken blood coagulation test while they were doing this. And what they found is, is that the solar flaring and geomagnetic activity was also affecting the rate of blood coagulation. Um, so what we find here is this stuff is directly affecting our whole biological system. But what's interesting about this is then when, you know, when they correlated nine years of data, which is what the chart in the upper right is, you know, um, basically they, um, there was two readings. Um, let me see if I can get my pointer here. So we have here, you know, basically in um, March and in August, which is six months apart, and they, um, Basically, we're looking at, um, well, I'm trying to turn my pointer off here. Um, <laughs> but we, um, <laughs> I usually use this on screen, so I'm trying to figure out how, to, I mean, with a pointer up at a screen. Um, so anyway, what he found is, is that when, yeah, in March, so we're looking over at the right, and what we're looking at is we're looking at, um, our solar system from the perspective of the galactic center. So basically in March, the sun's coming up around and pointing towards Earth. Um, I'm sorry, pointing towards the galactic center, and that's when it's going its fastest in the uh, whole elliptical cycle uh, because the sun speeds up and slows down as it goes through the ellipse, at least according to that model. So at the greatest drop, is when the um, sun was pointing right towards the galactic center. So what we find is even, you know, not just the solar and, you know, geomagnetic activity, but actually our relationship to the galactic center is also affecting these, you know, our biological functions, chemical testing, et cetera. Indeed, there's, so, if um, you remember Thomas Brophy from Magical Egypt 1, Episode 3, he it, was... He's, he's coming up later. Okay. Well, he wants to create a watch or he was working on a watch that would let you know when the galactic center was becoming active within our world, I guess, because he was so convinced that it had an important effect. All right. So sidereal time. I track it. I mean, I pretty much um, keep track of where that is at. Um, I'm trying to think of where it's at right about now. It's probably. Um, somewhere below the horizon i mean no because it circles around every day and that's the pleroma that's the pleroma it's not it's no black hole there there's theoretical physicists this is made up in their uh, discursive trail beneath matter it's a plasma z pinch as they call it um it's a creative dynamic plasma which is happening there and in, in other talks i do we delve more into that look at the radio maps and things of the galactic center but that was a little bit off the subject for the stream that we're doing on on this one here um so absolutely it is and that's what they call it sidereal time and um yeah some of the was it the remote viewing experiments had dames in them they were finding uh, that certain um positions of the galactic center were affecting people's ability to um you know, have this distant vision capacity. Amazing. So there is a lot to it. And um, it, yeah, it takes a bit. I've gone through that in the past, tried to figure out how to set up a little timing thing. So yeah, if Tom does it, I'll, I'll get one. I need it. <laughs> 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 anyway, well, um, 
move on. I want to bring up Kazarev. So a lot of people know about Kazarev from Corson Fields and his uh, mirrors where people would sit inside these circular mirrors at scientists in Russia and between like 800 kilometers apart and they could send with him an envelope with a symbol and they'd open it up and the person in the other symbol would, you know, was able to remote view it. So anyway, Kazarev, um, he studied how binary stars evolve. You know, he was one of the top scientists, absolutely brilliant, brilliant man in the Russian um, pantheon of scientists. Unfortunately, we never hear much about the really good stuff in the West. They studied how binary stars evolve. They grow to resemble each other more rapidly than can be explained by accepted scientific principles. So he hypothesizes portion field, the density of time, like scalar energy, which connects cosmic bodies and Earth, creating instantaneous transfer of effects, which will allow them to come into resonance. So claim to show true positions of stars versus past positions of optical telescopes by portion balance changes. He said time does not propagate like EM waves, but appears at all at once all over the universe. That's why the connection through time must be instantaneous one. So it's possible to observe some phenomena of very far astronomical bodies in real time without delay. This perspective does not contradict the special theory of relativity because when we have instantaneous connection through time, there are not movements of material objects. So basically in simple terms, this what this little diagram is showing here is they're doing an irreversible experiment which is just basically a chemical reaction. And it's actually affecting the weight and mass of a disconnected object. They did a lot of this. So he figured that this is the torsion field, as he called it. And I just want to introduce the idea here. People can look up the torsion field in the aura. I'm putting the references at the bottom of these. People can rewatch this and go back and look these up themselves. And if they figure out more than me and they think I'm not right and we can expand knowledge or look at ways of doing it, that's what this is all about. You know, um, that's awesome. Yeah. So basically he was looking at torsion fields of like the sun. And um, so he would measure sort of, they would scan with these uh, reflective mirror torsion field devices he would make. So if we look on the left here, that chart. So the, the left reading is what he called the position of astronomical of, uh, in the future. The center is a position of astronomical at the present position, and the right is a position of the astronomical position in the past. So this is based on the thesis that, like, let's say the sun, the sun slide takes eight minutes to get here. So basically, the one on the right, that's what we're seeing, but he's measuring one in the middle and one in the advanced position. Um, I don't agree with his interpretation of this, and I'm actually in some wonderful discussions on this with. Uh, uh, friend of mine, Juan, who's a brilliant bioarchitect I work with, who's very much into the torsion fields. And we're looking at different ways of interpreting this. But what's important here is that he's measuring an interesting field, which is not in the regular scientific lexicon. And they're trying to explain it within relativistic physics. But this stuff's all been like through Stephen Crowther's work and others. I mean, this stuff's all been falsified. And we need to get past those antique sort of chains that are holding back thought. So this just to introduce the torsion fields. But in the further thing, then we have um, Vasiliev's work, Sergei uh, Vasiliev. He developed uh, off of um, Kazarev's work, what he called the long range action fields. You know, concept effect, not energy transferred. So true physical process proven by decades of experiments. So it's influences sun, moon, planets, and stars on seismic activity influences the plant Mars and the sun on seismic activity are confirmed statistically reliably in the subregion of the U.S. West Coast and part of Mexico, subregion of Japan whole. So the sun acts on the seasonal changes of seismic activity, essentially differently in different subregions. But also when we look at this chart here, and this is one of many, and this is a complex subject, so I'm just trying to get some of these ideas out simply to show the effects. <clears throat> this is Mars on the ecliptic over years. And as we know, Mars doesn't go around once a year. It's, it moves along the ecliptic, and it's, what, I can't remember how many years it takes to go around. Um, and they'll do statistical analysis of seismic activity in different regions and, um, and show that, it, and so this is over multiple years. Um, what years is this? I think I forgot to put the dates in on this. Oh, in no, 73 to 2009. 2009. Yep. Consistent reading on that. <clears throat> so anyway, 
this paper can be found the factual data on celestial bodies influence on seismic activity what's important here is just that they're measuring these things there are effects like when mars or saturn or even they've measured out to andromeda galaxy across the horizon or the meridian they're measuring instantaneous effects which they're saying well it can't be relativistic so they're still trying to stay within the relativistic realm um, of thought right but they're saying there's still some there's an action field it's not energy it's action so <laughs> it's their way around it the, the point is is there's something happening and then valery smirnov he was uh another he was at the research institute of hypercomplex systems in geometry and physics uh friazino russia um and Instit Russian Institute of Theoretical and Experimental Biophysics, Russian Academy of Science. So experimental physicists working on accelerator physics. Um, so he, he was very interested in uh, Kazarev's work. And uh, Kazarev had developed these gyroscopic detectors. So Smirnov had actually developed specialized detectors for these torsion fields. And here's one, transit of Venus to the disk of the sun. And it shows the readings that they get, right? Here's a drop in the reading. On it. So basically, without getting too much into the theoretical or even the mechanics of these things, the point is, is they're measuring fields that are outside the, the uh, what we call the linear electromagnetic spectrum, which Western world kind of considers the whole of everything, mere vibrations. Your brain power varies throughout the year, peaking in autumn. And this is, again, northern hemisphere but as we saw there's different activity in geolo different geological zones i've lived in the southern hemisphere for the last 24 years so you know i always try to keep my mind open is it um, still autumn down but, here or is it autumn only up in the northern hemisphere in spring here or is it autumn everywhere um, um well we're heading into the spring equinox here south of the equator um, oh, no, 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 we just had spring equinox last month. Yes, yeah. we did. Yeah. So, no, we're, in, we're spring. This no, is but spring. I'm saying the effects. So the <laughs> you can't effects. tell anymore. The weather is so screwy. I know, I know. It's crazy here. <laughs> but if, if the effects, if your bra brain power peaks in autumn in California, does our brain power peak in spring in Queensland? That, that's a good question. I don't have the answer. This, I mean, there's a lot of... You know, re, re, um, you know, what are you calling it? Um, there's a lot of data to analyze on this. We're sure. just trying to look at the, there aren't variations in it. And um, sure. yeah, wider range. I just came across September 2018. I just see these little things I clip them out from in PowerPoint to keep the thought lines going. Cosmic ray variations of solar origin in relation to human physiological state during the December 2006 solar extreme events. That was a paper I came across. And also, too, I wanted to point this out, experimental evidence for variability in Planck's constant. This is another one of these worshipped symbols of modern science, Planck's constant. Right? One of my favorite scientific quotes, Planck, he said, uh, uh, you know, the progression of science, you know, science progresses one funeral at a time, and he's dead, right? <laughs> and uh, Dr. Robitaille, who I mentioned earlier with this guy scholar and his electric hydrogen model, he's shown the non-universality of, uh, you know, failure of Kirchhoff's law and non-universality of Planck's constant. I mean, it, it works for certain things, but it doesn't mean that we're really going into quantum effects beneath that. It, it's, it, people take these paradigms too seriously with, without considering all ramifications surrounding them. So basically, there's a variability of Planck's constant, so how could it be the base of matter? Like we looked earlier at um, Kepler's music of the spheres, the har harmonies of the spheres with the platonic solids, and I found a paper, I've been looking to find it again, um, which is actually showing that there's actually a statistical analysis of this at a deep level. There's a lot of truth to that, but it varies off at the edges. And if, look, the Schiller Institute published a book years ago, a uh, manual on the rudiments of tuning and registration, where they got into this whole thing where C equals 256 is the basis of everything. It goes up and down. We're in the middle, right? The ground of matter isn't like quantum stuff, right? That's, that's man's kind of descent into matter. That's part of the failure of modern consciousness to grasp that we're at the balance between two things. This is where we measure from, is in between, not from some base level. And, 
and add up or multiply up or or whatever. Not that there isn't anything yet in these numbers. They're dynamic. They work in physical equations, but not in everything. So we're finding areas where they don't work, and we're finding that they are variable in certain things. And, and as Rupert Sheldrake shown, the only reason these things are constants is because they quit measuring them and decided they were constants and told everybody they were, because they're not. So anyway, <laughs> did you have a question? I saw you pop back up there, Benice. I was just, I was just saying, you know, I'm hearing you. <laughs> so it's all good. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll keep rolling on here. Um, still got a bit of ground to cover. Um, and we've gone almost an hour, so I will speed it up a bit. Uh, did deadly gamma ray bursts cause mass extinction on Earth, right? We, you know, we go through these periodic galactic core eruptions, which may have been the cause of extinction level events on Earth. I mean, I'm, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not one for the steady progression of evolution. There's punctuated equilibria going on there. So we get these basic galactic core eruptions. To come through. Paul LaViolette, he was hypothesizing, right, that we we're actually in, and he was saying that they maybe even occurred every 13 to 26,000 years, which is interestingly keyed to the precessional cycle, you know, and that they could potentially have something to do with it. Um, but I like John Jenkins brought up, you know, that, you know, Oliver Reiser's concept that in proton precession, that the uh, proton recesses at the rate of its distance from the field that's affecting it. So in that sense, we're 26,000 light years from the center of the galaxy and our precessional rate is 26,000 years. There seems to be something happening to that, but it does seem as though we might be, I agree with Paul LaViolette that it believes that, that believe we're at the beginning of, there is a, a wave hitting us from the galactic center. Uh, it started hitting in the 50s if you look at solar irradiance charts and things and then it brought in this big happening of um, solar activity, but now it seems whatever part of the wave is doing, it's starting to damping and it down. So, you know, the sun is controlled from the galactic center and the electric currents. That's an electric universe. This whole nuclear furnace gravity model is nonsense, um, even though it's taught in academia and, and many people believe it. Um, but there's a, a true intellect will examine all sides of the factor and the uh, intellectual ferment happening within the electric universe fields now is fantastic. So, I mean, what happens, you know, we get, okay, cosmic radiations, is, you know, is it going to alter us for good or bad? You know, what really happens with these things? I, I love these pictures, whoever comes up with these art. Um, Great, aren't they? <laughs> so, so the, Ebner, the Ebner effect, right? In laboratory experiments, you know, Guido Ebner and his associate Heinz Schurch, they were exposing cereal seeds and fish eggs to electrostatic fields. And as you know, there was a work for a big Swiss agriculture company. So basically, they were trying to figure out what might happen is, you know, they're probably looking at it from commercial purposes. Um, and what they found is, is basically the plants were, were returning to stronger sort of pre-breeding forms. Um, both fish, you know, fish were, you know, were getting characteristics. Um, of primitive species that had sort of died out, even though they were derivatives of them. So we get mo these morphological changes. And, um, you know, there was, um, uh, you know, John Burke and Kaj Halberg's book, you know, Seeds of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty, where they were hypothesizing, right, like the Mayans, they called their pyramids ma uh, uh, maize mountains. So they were hypothesizing that maybe because there was this whole explosion of agriculture and stuff, and weird, I mean, Corn. It was like some grass, and all of a sudden, it's this agricultural crop, and it's happened all over the world. And there was all these pyramids and things built all over the world, and they do create electrostatic fields. So it's very possible that these were the technology that were used to make the local grasses and things into agricultural crops for the development of civilizations. And we can see in testing that there's no doubt about it that these effects happen. And, and there's a little thing there from That's Rex amazing. Research if people want to look up more on Ebner and the Ebner effect. It's, a, it's fantastic, which means that species changes basically probably happen electrically or electrostatically or energetically. But when we talk about space being electric and plasma, it's not just electrons and stuff. You, know, we, you can't keep thinking discursive terms. It's, we call it electroalchemical. It's intelligent. It's forming everything. It's what we derive from. We're anthropic consciousness nodes within this matrix, which is formed by it. So, I mean, that really leaves us. 
Sorry, John. I'm just saying it's just mind blowing. It really is. It's amazing. Sorry. Oh, that's cool. No, so what science? You know, yeah, this whole quantum thing. Quantum states are a subsensible mirror of the supersensible metamorphic spiritual processes manifesting in the out, outer world as animal, plant, and mineral realms. You know, later including functional processes of minerals, let's say water. You know, water is not a mineral. It's a mineraloid. It only becomes a mineral when it's crystal. Quite interesting. But in that, we have the metamorphoses of clouds too, which are not being disrupted by you know the, the electromagnetic nature of uh, mankind's doings. But prior to that, you know, I studied Luke Howard's work, the metamorphoses of clouds. He was the guy who came up with you know stratus, cumulus, uh, nimbus, and um, Anyway, whatever the other, so many things going through my mind at the moment. Um, he was a contemporary of Goethe, and they corresponded on that. So really, there's this metamorphic process, and sure, so the quantum states are showing us something, and they're getting, they're deriving things that they can manufacture, technology which enslaves us and stuff. It's great stuff, um, and it's also killing everybody in the process, um, damaging our health. So Goethe, the metamorphoses of plants, this is really what I wanted to introduce here. It took a while to get to it, um, probably too much info. Metamorphoses of plants is the process by which one and the same organ presents itself to us in manifold forms. It's like humans, animals, we're, we're in soul. You know, we've got the organs inside us. Plants don't. Plants are a single organ, the plant, that goes through these metamorphic stages. And Goethe would look at, let's say, leaves, like the... Uh, leaf at the top, that's a common buttercup. And that's actually different parts of the plant have different shaped leaves as the plant develops. So sometimes the plant itself will have the different shaped leaves going up it. Or as the plant progresses over time, sometimes through a couple different seasons, the plant leaves will metamorphose, sometimes from simple to complex, sometimes from complex to simple. So there's different forms. So what he would do is he would build these images up in his mind of the plant going back and forth because what's the plant you can look at it at any one point and say that's not the whole of the plant we look at a human or an animal say that's a human in its current state of development but it's not the same for the plant because the plant's whole state of development organically is its entire temporal timeline because the ether is a temporal phenomenon so he would be able to review this whole plant as an entire temporal structure in his mind and a process what he called exact sensorial fantasy and Steiner pointed to this as the true usage of the imagination for processing natural phenomena and this actually then gives one a spiritual view or a higher view of the spiritual nature of what formed living substances and processes on our planet and this picture on the right is a sketch of Goethe's on the archetypal plant you know of all the um well it wasn't Goethe but of his concept of of there only being one plant, there is only one plant, which is the vegetative surface of the planet. It's a whole, and we need to think this whole, and then we can understand the part. For science, they've taken the whole thing apart and looking at the DNA inside and starting to manipulate, and they think that that's where it comes from. But the timing actually comes out of the cosmos itself. And here we see the plant family tree. So here is like the whole of the vegetative surface of the planet as an expression of the earth lines or archetypal plant as a whole. And we can think in this. It's not discursive. This isn't a soundbite thing. I'm just pointing out where people can um, go to think about these. There's a book called Man or Matter by Ernst Lairs. And it's like, well, what's the base of science? Man, meaning in the old sense, humanity alone. You know, we're not picking on women here, you know, sorry liberals that got hurt on that one um, <laughs> um, or matter you know man or ma what, what, what's the basis of science taking matter apart or understanding our functional functionality and our position in the universe so let's look here again here here's plant life over time plant plant data analysis in the fossil records and basically we can see here Devonian this is Paleozoic era Mesozoic, age of dinosaurs, Cenozoic, and we're up at the end. These are the flowering plants here. And these are other plants that started up, some died down, etc. cetera. Um, but the flowering plants didn't really start showing up till the Jurassic era. And of course, that's around the same time that the insects evolved. Insects that were around before that were actually of different types than there are today. And there's this whole plant insect symbiosis 
you know, which the scientists say, well, just what, what by amazing coincidence, you know, <laughs> this all sort of evolved together, but they're intertwined, which is a subject of a larger discussion. But I just wanted to show here, so we can think of the plants as a metamorphosis of flowering plants coming later. This is, we see leaf evolution, that the whole process of the plants evolving on the planet itself is a larger metamorphic process. And in case anyone thinks that these years, I mean, Permian, 290,000, Carboniferous, 354 million years, like, I don't know about that. Because there's human objects found in like the Pennsylvanian cold beds, and uh, there's these out of place artifacts all over. So forget about the years. You can believe that if you want. Um, you know, the Hindus use this because it, to them, humans been around for hundreds of million years, and biblical creationists, this is proof that the earth is young. I just say it's proof that the standard th theory needs some serious uh, revamping. Indeed. And this is from a David Attenborough. So this is that, that plant data analysis put into pictorial form. So we can actually watch the growth of the plant data over time. And this gives us a picture of it as it evolves. So these are all different plant species. Some died out. You can see some are continued on ferns, etc. And um, then what we see then is now the flowering plants start coming in. They've colored that differently. <clears throat> and with the data spread, so what you can see is actually the um, whole evolution of the plant life itself into the flowering plants and their types is almost a plant-like growth looking at the Gertian process in this larger scale. Well, thank you, David Attenborough, for That's that. That's just amazing, isn't it? It's just perfect. <laughs> it is. And then planetary influence upon plants. Well, what is the timing mechanism of plants? Where does this stuff come from? So uh, there's a quite a large field of this, which has grown out of uh, biodynamic agriculture. Most of it's in German, very little in English, but I would recommend people get this book who are interested planetary influences upon plants. We see at the top, you know, bindweed, you know, basically morning glory, that's mercury sun. The uh, umbellifers, you know, we see the basically sun, Mars, Jupiter patterns growing with them. Even the dandelion flower is, you know, sun, Mars, Jupiter. So we see this stuff intertwined within. And again, this isn't sound bite stuff. I'm just gonna throw a few ideas out here for people to get a larger idea. So we look, the monocotyledons, they follow the Sun-Mercury synodical rhythm. And um, this goes into great depth when one starts understanding it. So I'm just showing the superficial layers here so people can get the idea. Um, and here's one that's a little better known to people, the uh, Venus-Sun synodical rhythms is in the dicotyledons. And, um, and we see this, we see it in the apple, we see it in the papaya, you, know, you cut them you know, axially. And you see them in all sorts of flowers. They're not the only one, but it's the dominant one. And you know, the back out, you're basically looking at two fifths, you know, the way the petioles come out, coming up the stems, you know, looking at the dicotyledons, two fifths of the shoot circumference is every 144 degrees. So like a spiral every six leaf is the synodical period. It, but then we get more rare three A's and some of the crucifers and aconites, snapdragon plantain. That's actually the sidereal period of Venus. So I say there's um, quite complexity, and I know there's people are going to be able to understand this more. I'm throwing this out there in the hopes that people can pick it up and some uh, 3D animator friends can help, you know, develop this into a way that people can understand it better. I, these are the things, I'm no expert in any of these. These are the things I'm interested in, and I learned by putting these together and sharing this information. So I'm naturally looking for feedback, and I'm looking for people to understand better to do things. So I can just sit back and watch it and learn. So here we go, we'll and this planetary organism. Flowering plant displays and form interplay planetary worlds surrounding Earth. Yeah, and that's important. This is, as though Earth is the center, is how these things react, because they don't have any intellect. I try and like screw them up and tell them that, you know, that measurements are different than what they experience. This is the experiential world is Earth center. Um, you know, Earth around the sun, they, they can measure it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but there's different layers of space. And in the anthropocentric space, this is how things function. So the root is the moon, center shoot is the sun and its, and its movement of the movement of mercury closely tied to the sun. The perianth, um, which is basically, 
you, you know, um, Venus moving out into the periphery, you know, uh, that's pu pushing out what we call it the, um, anyway, stamens and pollination. Won't get too deep into plant biology here. Ovary, Mercury is in fact isolated by the moon, fruit development, image of Jupiter oriented towards the zodiac, seed development, isolation of the sun and Mercury is effect by the moon, and the seed is a prerequisite for self-contained plant forms, Saturn. So again, this is a really so great is just, example of uh, as above, so below, right? You're looking at a whole planetary organism reflected this, in the plant. This is the real thing. And it also, it's... It's not fractal because, well, everything's fractal. Top, bottom, air, fractal, everything's fractal. So, go, well, no, there's this larger dynamic. You can think of it maybe as a metaphoric type of fractal and its process. Um, but no, this is, you know, the dimensionality of these motions and the way they happen. This is really, um, no, you're absolutely right. This is the grander scale of as above, so below. It's not a simple thing of just looking at spirals above and spirals below. That was the point I was trying to get. I showed them at the beginning so we could get through that phase. Um, so here's the archetypal plant um, and looking at it in the different phases, like the monocots. Um, let's see, I'll get my little pointer here again. You know, the grasses, predominant influence of the sun, you know, sun interaction with the moon, which causes you know, the lesser leaf activity. Then water lilies, predominance of the moon, bindweeds, you know, which are the prominent influence of mercury. And we can think of that, see, because the mercury overrides the sun, right? Because the bindweeds, you know, they, they wind around, you know, the uh, leaves actually are more powerful than the stem in the way they do it. And I showed in the picture by the book that their blossoms are actually based on a sun-mercury relationship. Um, you know, in, in, in this whole thing, right, the sense of form morphology, you know, it's not to follow a botanical system, but the significance of the plants in their natural environment. Um, you know, like I say, the grasses, they're dominant in where sunlit areas and stuff. And so we go through, but what's interesting with mercury in the bindweed, the convolvulaceae, there's a lot of tryptophan derived alkaloids in there, the beta carbolines, like, you know, harmine, harmaline, and uh, ergolines, you know, like ergobelicine, which is actually like LSD like derivatives and stuff are fun. It was kind of very curious being Mercury, the messenger of the gods, and you get and and the relationships, even at the chemical level in these things. And you'll find too that in herbology, plants related to planets tie in with this whole pattern too. The buttercups, you know, the ranunculaceae, and we've got the simple buttercup, but then most of the buttercups are more complex form like this, which leads to the rose, which is basically what Goethe called the comprehensive manifestation of the type, overall the type of flower. It's like the perfect flower we could think, which is why it's, and it's also in path curve geometry, of um, uh, what we look at is, and the bud of the rose is also tied into the shape of the heart as well, there's a lot. Anyway, we'll get, into uh, Jupiter, we're getting into the um, umbellifers, which actually includes like celeries and things like that. And then outer planets, the compositates, basies, sunflowers. Each petal is a flower on these. Those are, comp I agree to call them compositates, is a com composite flower. So these are holes. So when you look at a sunflower, you're not looking at a single flower. You're looking at every one of those leaves is a flower. So it's, it's quite interesting. You know, way of you know looking at these things so these just again look at the plant world in a different way because they're all connected to the universe lawrence edwards he, he discovered that plant buds change form rhythmically that the rhythms are those of the alignment of the moon with the bodies of the solar system a specific tree or flower changes the form of its buds and the rhythm of the lunar alignments with a specific body the oak, for example, appears to change with Mars, the beach with Saturn, the birch with Venus. Edwards' research is the first and only one to have, from first mathematical principles, successfully described any biological form. This implies DNA cannot alone be the propagator of living form, and random processes alone cannot drive evolution. Right? Which we're already seeing effects of this. So chart. Uh, on the left, beach bud clearly shows form of a real bud undergoing approximate fortnightly change. It is the rhythm of alignment of the moon with the body of the solar system, in this case, Saturn. The right, alignment of the Earth, moon and Mars, and the corresponding change of bud form. So basically, we can see on this little chart, right, during conjunctions and oppositions, 
Edwards, he was measuring these things for decades. He was over in England. So it's again, anthroposophical research. And budworkshop.co.uk, uh, he wrote a book called The Vortex of Life. Um, so all this information is available for people to go and check out. Um, there's no limits on what you can learn. Um, Baron von Herzl, uh, not the soil brings forth the plant, but the plant the soil. So it, he describes experiments in the origin of inorganic substances. He proved that plants create matter. In seeds sprouting into silled water, the original content of potash, phosphorus, magnesium, calcium, sulfur, nitrogen, and every one of the plant's components increased. And it's also shown through fertilization, plants could seemingly transmute phosphorus into sulfur, calcium into phosphorus, magnesium into calcium, carbonic acid into magnesium, nitrogen, oxygen, or nitrogen. And these were all P Professor Pierre Berenger, uh, director of the laboratory Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. He validated uh, this work. In, um, agricultural test in 1963, incontestably proved this with leguminous seeds and things. Um, and of course we do it too, within our bodies, we're constantly changing things. Theory of smart plants may explain the evolution of global ecosystems. So easy to think of plants as passive features of their environments, serving as a backdrop for the bustling animal kingdom. But what if the ecosystems of the world take their various forms because plant decisions make them that way? One of the first global theories of land biome evolution, the researchers write that plants may actively behave in ways that not only benefit themselves, but also determine the productivity and composition of their environs. There's a lot of really good research going on now in um, you know, plant communication. Uh, Professor Suzanne Samard up in uh, Vancouver, brilliant work. You know, she's got TED Talk and uh, documentaries and stuff. There's no doubt about it. Plants are highly intelligent. They're just acting differently than us. Plants are capable of complex decision making. And then there's another quote from below, which I've quoted earlier, of Herzl, what lives may die, but nothing is created dead. That's what science say. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, first there was nothing, then a bunch of dumb matter blew out of nowhere. And then somehow some scum crawled out and evolved into us. And just by chance, we can think, ain't, ain't, that, ain't we lucky, right? Um, <clears throat> Here, Rudolf Hauschka, a lot of people know his name from the fine cosmetics and stuff they're sold in, because um, he developed the techniques for preserving the uh, biological processes. He was founder of Walla Pharmaceuticals, and his nature of substance, you know, he duplicated von Herzl's experiments. So he showed life cannot be interpreted in chemical terms because life results from something which precedes the elements. Matter is the precipitate of life. As Steiner said, the chemist, uh, the Elements of the chemist are the corpses of cosmic processes. The so matter, you know, plants can generate matter from a non-material sphere and can again etherealize it. The so matter emerges and disappears in rhythmic sequence to lunar cycles. So what Hauschka found is when he's growing sprouts in the distilled water, duplicating um, uh, von Herzl's experiments, that there was actually you know there was a general increase, but there was fine there was moments on their super fine scales where matter was decreasing and if and he was charting it over 12 years i didn't show all the charts i'm showing a basic one weight changes the sprouting seeds in a closed system it's not like the weight goes down below you know where it started at the beginning but in the statistical analysis of the weight there, there's spurts and declines it's quite you know spurts obviously being greater than declines um and um without going too much into this just and then the nature of matter the nature of substance they have potentization curves, so we can take something from the plant, like benzoic acid. You do different homeopathic dilution, then you do biological testing. And the center part is you get the, um, the um, what they call potentization curves at the different dilutions. And using synthetic benzoic acid, you get nothing. And there's a distilled water as a test, which shows basically that there's something to life. Hauschka proposed that the vitamins aren't chemicals, but certain chemical structures carry the vitamins, and the vitamins are the ethers themselves. One of my favorite scientists, Jagadis Chandra Bose, the scientist who, who befriended plants and metals. So Bose, response in the living and non-living. The response phenomena in plants lie intermediate between those in animals and metals. So basically we'd have a, here's animal plant mineral response curves. We have a 
some animal tissue, got a signal running through it, looking at the oscilloscope screen. You basically drug it with ether or chloroform or some other way of putting some sort of substance into it. You can see exactly where the response curve occurs. This is in plants, but he was founding, he invented a thing. For the Bose, he, he father of microwave. He, he was doing microwave transmission before Tesla and Marconi were really doing radio. So he invented microwave transmitter receiver, waveguide, torn antennas. Um, you know, this guy, he was way ahead. First semiconjunction, you know, 1899. So he invented this thing called the Kreska graph for um, working on the electrical nature of conduction of stimuli in plants, which had been thought of a chemical in nature. So that's what he was discovering. I and mean, he's getting these anomalous readings and he started testing the metals. And he found that the metals could be drugged too. So what this shows living response in all diverse manifestations is only be found in repetition of spot responses seen in the organic. Nowhere in the entire range of these response phenomena, inclusive as it is of metals, plants, and animals, do we detect any breach of continuity. So the metals, so what we could think of as organic responses is arising in the inorganic levels. As Bose, I'm sorry, not Bose, uh, Picardi showed, you know, those levels are being affected. So let's go, al alchemical thought, right? In alchemy, you know, and you know, what did um, Rudolf Hauschka said, alchemy is the last fruit of a glorious past, right? As these great wisdom knowledges were declining and in, in his, we're heading towards what Steiner called mankind's descent into matter in the fifth post-Atlantean epoch, you know, the alchemy was the last attempt to preserve this ancient knowledge and develop it. So if we look at it in that sense, gold in the sun, silver in the moon, iron Mars, Mercury, Mercury, tin, Jupiter, copper, Venus, and Saturn, lead, there may be more to this than just uh, the primitive idiots say, you know, primitive chemistry, we're lucky that at least they tried because it led us to where we are. So Steiner tasked Lily Kalisco, a brilliant medical doctor, with uh, seeing if there was a scientific method connection between the metals and the planets. Um, so here we have gold in the sun, uh, gold chloride chromatograms. So basically what I showed in the previous picture was, uh, I should have explained it in a second. Um, so she take blotter paper, so she take a gold, basically gold chloride, silver nitrate, lead sulfate, iron, you know, et cetera. Dissolve it in acid solution, then put uh, blotter paper, and so it would rise contra gravity, so the cosmic forces flowing in would affect its crystallization process. So these are flattened out crystallization. So right, so it, it, right here we've got, basically this is a standard sort of gold crystallization pattern that you would see um, within those. And these are, bef before, during, and after uh, eclipse on June 29th, 1927. So we still see some of the characteristic patterns. We see the disruption within it during, and then it takes a while to really read these. These are scanned plates out of her books. Um, but you can see in these, she did four decades of experiments. I'm just showing a couple examples here to give an idea that this is actually happening. Then silver in the moon. So solution of silver nitrate, silver and aqua regia poured into a glass vessel. Okay, we know the process. Silver rises, attaining its maximum state during the day. So link up to here. And then at night, when the sun goes down, it rises up again to here. So no matter how much silver is contained in the vessel, the same thing happens. So, um, so the second ascent, because Moon rolls the night, even though the moon's not always up, it goes through its cycle, but there's something about the moon rolling. When the sun's not in effect, the moon rolls, right? As was the old knowledge. The moon's sphere, not necessarily just the physical moon that we see, but nonetheless, they're connected. So here we have 1936 solar eclipse effects, gold chloride and silver nitrate mixed. So here we are, this is uh, June, so this is the day before, and we get the two of them mixed together, we get this pit. And then the next day, when the exact same solution, when the moon goes in front of the sun, the first little chloride pictures I showed, we get the nighttime picture arises, showing again that you know the moon's rolling when the sun's off. So many, many experiments.
experiments. I did a video a few years ago, um, which there's a YouTube link. Anybody wants to check it on my YouTube channel. Workings of the stars and earthly substances. And this is lead-Saturn conjunction. Lead basically makes no pattern on its own. Uh, so Lily discovered with silver nitrate and iron sulfate, you could get a certain pattern, and then the addition of lead nitrate gave it this certain characteristic, which we see here. During a major, and again, there's a lot more to it. This is a simple version. You can watch the video for all the plates. Uh, when during a major conjunction of the sun, when Saturn is behind the sun, this is what happens. The pattern disappears. So we can see pretty plain the difference so all this information is available so <clears throat> so basically you know we've got these connections and like when Lily was showing during the um, uh, solar eclipse with the gold you know we get these dark streaks and bent things and she started thinking she gave a talk in 1964 called gold in the signs of the times where she's saying well well geez you know starting in like the mid 1950s I was getting these dark streaks all the time the gold that wants to crystallize what can we do what's causing it can we still use this as a homeopathic remedy for you know gold is homeopathic for uh, the heart uh, which they still do so i figured they <clears throat> but she's going what in the world was it enough to me it was obvious the electrification of the planet and also lawrence edwards i've shown his bud shapes in the moon and the outer planets he, i want to read something from uh, his book here on one particular bud shape one tree he was studying, he says, turning away some bewilderment when I suddenly saw what, of course, I had not really known to the time, but had not the wit to appreciate that this tree was growing only a few yards from an electricity station. Great transformer was humming away on the other side of a fence labeled danger, 33,000 volts. And the high tension cable came into the substation only a few feet above the topmost branches. It was obviously growing in a powerful artificial magnetic field. And the question naturally rose whether such conditions formed a shield which would cut the plant off from the cosmic connections in which it was otherwise enmeshed, which it did. So the plants growing near electric fields didn't exhibit the planetary botany effects of the others. And of course, it's not hard to figure the way this world's going, you know, with this crap of electromagnetism. Because what Tesla discovered was non electromagnetic. The, uh, longitudinal currents were far different. Um, you say they don't fit the electromagnetic spectrum, and I, I dealt with this in other talks on Goethe's theory of color and vessel physics, but basically, you know, science experiments find plants won't grow near Wi-Fi. Radiation from Wi-Fi affects the blood heart. To me, it's sort of like <clears throat> that old movie Poltergeist, right? We've got these electric lines running everywhere, basically pumping lower astral crap, you know, it's electromagnetic rubbish. Um, out of the ethers, and what's seeing in the whole world looking at porn? I mean, what's the web? But of course, CERN, they've got priority over it, but then the second biggest thing is porn, then it's ads, and actually find good information. That's like a you know, minor percentage. Ocean acidification via electromagnetic ionization. Dung beetles use stars in the night sky to navigate, the old symbol of the Egyptians there. Magneto reception. So we've got them. I mean, I've always been able to sense north, at least more so when I was younger. I always felt, even blindfolded, I could be spun around and find directions when I stopped being dizzy. Um, sharks have them. It's all over, but we're screwing up with this whole electrification of the planet. Basically cutting ourselves off. And of course, CERN's no help. Um, CERN itself is basically based on Earth-Moon geometry. These guys are not stupid. There's something bigger going on there than just trying to find little tiny particles. It's basically based, as Joseph Patrick Farrell has shown in uh, his amazing work, that this is basically Nazi belt technology, and it's basically connected back through to secret projects and Nazi belt technology of the Second World War. And, of course, they've got priority over turn, uh, I mean, over the Internet, because they developed it. Um, but the fact that they're actually using this Earth-Moon geometry within it which was used by many ancients. And, and it's also on a ley line, as Scott Onstott's shown on in his work, which is, I put his website up there, Secrets in Plain Sight, where I've taken this from. Um, and it's, and I did a search up in the upper right corner, if you look, Apollyon, Switzerland, right? Because what do you get? Certain recruitment office. It's on Old Temple to Apollyon, who is the deepest, who is the, um, basically the demon of the deepest, of, of the, 
you know, the bottomless pit of revelations. And here we see this little cartoon here. I love these things. You know, from John Bunman, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, um, basically Christian fighting Apollyon to drive him off. You know, good always wins over evil, we hope, right? Um, and here's what we can see is BP Earthwatch. For a while, he was really watching this. Every time they'd fire up CERN, it would warp Earth's um, magneto pause. A lot of detailed information on this. So what's going on? People say, well, it doesn't have enough power, but who knows what sort of fields they're connecting to these geometries and connections. There's so much more to this. So, I mean, really, what, science, what in the world is science these days? You know, it's, um, is it just chemistry? Is it the corpses of, you know, materials of cosmic processes, people are just dealing with atoms, and everything's made this, you know, we're going to, you know, magnify Planck up, and people are lost on these things, you know, and some brilliant researchers, are, I won't call them lost, I just feel that their perspectives aren't fully comprehensive of the other side of things at this point, you know, so, I mean, and this has been beautiful about this, um, whole magical Egypt thing that you've been doing. I've been listening to all these researchers and you know, a few of them, they do ping on to these, uh, sub, you know, these quantum sort of things, but that, that's natural. I still use this. They're, they're useful metaphors, but they shouldn't be considered foundational absolutes. That's, I believe, where the error comes in. But well, the point is, is the merging of art and science and all the brilliant information that's come out so far, you know, through all the work that you and Venice and Chance have done. So, Basically, I've developed a whole thesis out of this <clears throat> between what I call the chronarchy versus organic time. The chronarchy is this electrical system, the timing, and we need to get back to the organic time, you know, that which connects us, you know, that'll allow the gold to crystallize properly again, because, you know, where's our gold in our heart, in our systems? So I just like making these slides for talks. <laughs> um, and we were talking you know, about before, the Renaissance, right? The Gothic cathedrals, you know, the Virgin Mary, this feminine impulse was coming in. And I got this out of a Louis the Carpenter's book, Louis Charpentier, which I read when I was a teenager. You know, the, the, um, it's puzzled me my whole life. And may have been one of the, this may have been one of the seminal clicks in my mind that drove me in this direction was that the cathedrals of North, Notre Dame cathedrals of Northern France are laid out on the landscape in the pattern of the constellation of Virgo. And when the Catholic Church went in, of course, what was the Black Mass? The Black Mass was the tantric rituals that were performed on the altars to connect heaven and earth. Obviously, these things were built just to like yeah, some mumbo jumbo and feed people bread and get their money. These are giant cosmic things connecting heaven and earth, and they were made for tantric rituals. So that's what the Black Mass of the church was trying to stop. They made it all sound evil and satanic, but it was obviously not. Um, and of course, the uh, labyrinth, a chart, they destroyed, the Catholic Church destroyed the labyrinths in a number of them, but they left that one alone, which is the yoni of um, the Virgin. So some, I'm sure people still use this, although we'll never get in there probably for that purpose. Um, but these connections to the heavens, what, you know, what, what's the point of these things? Um, and here, Chaco Canyon, uh, what a fantastic place. I've done a couple of expeditions there in the past. The, I knew about archaeoastronomy to a certain extent, but I didn't know. I mean, it's an 18.6-year lunar cycle. and um, but, but then they've also used advanced geometry to build monuments. So we're looking here at, uh, you know, uh, Pueblo Benito, which is the center of time. You know, all equinoxes and solstices, all sacred geometric relationship. And nobody really lived in these places. Even the rubbish mounds out front are fake. Are built to look like rubbish mounds, right? but analysis of them is they're not going now. And this thing's fantastic, and it measures the whole complex over a dozen major houses in and around the valley and other outliers. Complex, you know, 100 million cut sandstone blocks in the valley and a quarter million trees, but perfectly cut ends. They don't know where it came from. You go to the interpretive center, they got scrawny Indians and loincloths, dragon rocks and um, grinding the ends off of things. And you look at, this stuff was built at the same time as the Gothic uh, cathedrals. And um, they got the 18.6 year lunar cycle built into them. You know, so they go, well, it's a calendar, so they knew when to plant corn. I would have starved before they figured this one out. Um, so, 
yeah, why were they doing this? This is extremely important to them. And that's magnificent, but let's go here not, not to play. You brought up Tom Brophy earlier, and, um, and we've discussed this. This whole knob to play, these rude stones stuck in the desert. But what do they measure? They measure the precessional cycle of Orion. You know, basically the two positions over, you know, the half cycle, you know, basically 12,000 plus years, um, which is pretty amazing. But what I, I found that's amazing. But the most amazing thing to me is really this, these sighting circles, which are south of here, which measure the... Uh, the helical rising at the you know, vernal equinox, you know, we're looking 6,500 BC, 5,000, 6,000 BC, but that they also measure the distance to the stars. This, well, I heard that magical, that was one of the highlights of magical Egypt, of all amazing stuff in there. This still blows me away. And of course, they could, you say, well, they could have doused it and all that. And yeah, well, probably they did. Or maybe they were in a state of consciousness and they just walked out and knew where they were. We don't know what state of consciousness. But what I find fascinating is this um, incongruity between the fineness of the information and just these rude stones stuck in the ground. It's like they really need to get them there for something. They were doing something. This is technology. We don't know. I, I just, even with all I've gone around this, I, I, I'm not really sure. Unless they were using them for travel, for connections, communications of these higher beings. But Steiner said knowledge came from the stars. It's not like the Zodiac was, you know, drunk shepherds at night doodling, you know, in their minds looking at the stars. Because we got commonality all over the world. We look at Greg Matlaw stuff. We started out with the panpsychism. Stars are intelligent, can move on their own potentially. Um, they, and there's been theories that the, um, basically the Zodiac formed itself as a systems logic step-down transformer of these higher knowledge and all the violet gets into that a bit talking about yeah i think he still looks at the interpretation model but that you know the stinger of scorpio and the uh, arrow of sagittarius are pointing directly at the galactic center which is where these super waves come out of which transform things so there's a there's a higher knowledge to all this and even goes back let's go you know here's um basically Equinox and solstice markers. So if you're standing in Lascaux looking at this, th these are precise. Um, and what the, basically here, a handful of researchers <clears throat> witnessed the solstice light for the first time, the original thing. Okay, um, it only would have been bright enough to work for about an hour for several days each year. There's no soot on the ceiling. They weren't in there with torches doing all this painting. But this stuff's, and there's all sorts of zodiacs and stuff around in these caves. And I forget the woman's name. Um, I'm sorry I did. I meant to write down for this because it's a long, complex name. Is um, ancient astronomy, and I, and I can find it maybe in the discussions and give this to people, is, is that um, the caves that are painted, there's a lot of caves around that area, you know, southern France, northern um, Spain. The caves that have paintings are, oriented towards the equinox or sunrise and sunset solstices. And the ones that don't have those orientations don't have any paintings inside. So, and there's a lot of them. So we're going back 15 to 30,000 years on this stuff. So this, this isn't anything new either. So he could it be um, to, you know, like if you look at the Bible, they say to build heaven on earth. And, and Arthur Versluis is saying it's to rectify the rectify the earth, the you know the the material, and have it balance with the non-material. I mean, could it be a balancing act or a rectifying act of some sort to build these standing stones, or these little nebdaplier stones, or these big Mahira Jaro, you know, complexes? Mm. Yeah, it might be well. <laughs> The building it could be integrated into our consciousness themselves. Um, my good friend Jerry Vassilano is one of the most brilliant researchers I ever worked with who's basically gone into um, sort of what's called Ray Clues mode about 20 years ago. But <clears throat> he did a video series called The Ray of Discovery, and then he published The Vril Compendiums, which I published in Borderlands. His whole thesis, and he, he was quite well, I say, one of the most brilliant people I ever met. Um, and, and that 
there's a good pantheon to pull from there. But he was um, the whole thing, Ray of Discovery, that the Earth it, herself basically throws these ideas into inventors' minds to create. And he showed that the development of technologies actually followed geological lines and mineral lines and things across the world. And then in the process, then basically, then electrical lines, tel you know, telegraph lines, electrical lines, they were built up and then the things start following those, right? Because we were creating artificial ones. And um, so basically when we're in balance between earth and sky, perhaps these things were being built. And we look at the star maker, all of Stapleton's book. I don't know if you've ever read that. I recommend everybody read that at least once in their life. It's you're really missing it if you haven't. Um, but he was um, basically, you know, it's a union of all worlds. You know, this whole development of galactic consciousness, and um, he basically. But I was thinking, well, maybe you know, people needed some sort. Of, you know, they were all doing it in the mental realm, the telepathic realm. But maybe some of the development is this might be you might be able to travel. On these alignments not in the physical body but Jerry told me that he would do meditations at night he would connect himself radionically to the earth and stare at different stars and he would like connect to one star optically and we used to have long discussions about starlight being instantaneous you know none of this speed of light stuff through space um, and that's a whole another long argument that we've had a lot and I got this stuff through NASA myself originally and I've talked to astronauts who countered it, and my NASA contract said, well, he's, he's, a, he's a trained observer, and uh, he's reporting exactly what he saw. He said, but the information we gave you was correct. It, you can't see the stars optically without any special stuff in space. They had to develop special things. But so anyway, but then these discussions, which we were doing back at Borderlands back in the 80s and stuff, and looking at Tesla transmission, Stellar light's longitudinal transmission. So like we look at the sun, the sun dot is instant. That's real time. There is no transmission time. It's like Tesla longitudinal electricity. The blue stuff probably takes eight minutes. And then, of course, all the particulate stuff takes longer. Um, but then, you know, and then we're looking at long range action fields. We know that there are instantaneous effects from distant bodies that have been measured in a number of detectors and you know, geophysical experimentations. So. Yeah, we get that. Um, anyway, I'm forgetting we, these trails go on. But what he was all right. What Jerry was telling me was that he'd go to these other planets, and when he would, as he said, he'd see the whole timelines of civilizations rising and falling, and he he he'd go he'd insert himself in at different lines, and he'd actually encounter people and talk to them. And he said that he believed that when the people that he met on these other planets, they actually experienced him coming in as a UFO because he felt these lenticular shape craft like uh, energy things coming around him as he was like transcending into their level see so then you know, look i used to have a poster of all the different types of ufos we've seen like 100 different types and stuff so maybe this is the real thing rather than the carcass in a tin can we got you know get your carcass in a fancy tin can and catapult it across this empty space well space might not be empty and it might not be anything people think of because they're lost in this 3d consciousness rather than the projective geometric consciousness that Steiner pointed out was the higher order function of space, which then is what works anthropocentrically around the planet through cosmological botany. That's projective geometry, not 3D Euclidean matter, quantum effect type stuff, right? And it's, we're, we're out of that realm when we're dealing with these things. So uh, I'm getting talked out, so we're gonna have to... <laughs> The reader may want to know why the ancients thought they could go to heaven only on two solstice days. Because in order to change trains comfortably, the constellations that serve as gates to the Milky, Milky Way must stand upon the earth, meaning they must rise heliacally, either at the equinoxes or the solstices. The galaxy is a very broad highway, highway, but even so, there must have been some bitter millennia when neither gate was directly available any longer, one hanging in midair, the other having turned into a submarine entrance. <clears throat> and this is why. Well, it's all about. Uh, when you know Christ's second coming, well, what's Christ's second coming? Is Orion rising in the um, uh, you know, we're at the end of the precessional cycle now, right? The sun's conjuncting the galactic center, Orion's at the top, handshake position with the sun. So, here's some of the first alignments the 2012 era 2012, we'll call it. Galactic alignment was lunar eclipse, you know. 
December 22nd, and we look at Orion then. The moon's almost there, but it's obviously in the range. But then we look at the uh, galactic alignment solar eclipse, June 21st, solstice 2001. And where's the sun? Mind perfectly galactic center, the handshake position of the sun. This is <clears throat> basically, this is Christ rising right now. It's happening. The second coming is happening now, but everybody's lost in the electrical maze that's been created through this false paradigm. Kind of what the dark journalist has been doing a wonderful series. Nobody's ever seen his stuff, Daniel List. Another beautiful rabbit hole to go down. The eighth sphere that Steiner walked, warned about that Ariman trying to create to trap souls into. This is the matrix. And you were asking about astrology, right? Well, tropical astrology, which is the matrix, or Sidereal astrology, which is our true transpersonal connection to reconnect to the stars. You know, you can use both because they're both effective. But which one do you want to follow in the long run? Let me see. And then the center picture is from Adrian Gilbert, another brilliant researcher. Um, <clears throat> opening the stargate. So this was his interpretation. I, I got a lot of good, rich material from reading his books. Um, yeah, it says June 29th, 2000, Orion is Alpha and Omega. And this is between those two other alignments I just showed. Uh, so he's pulling it. This is something from the um, Book of Revelation. And, you know, Orion is seen looking up the north face of Great Pyramid, AD 2000. That's from uh, Mark Bidler's book I call The Most Ignored Book in Archaeoastronomy, uh, The Star Mirror, um, from back in the 90s which Gary David turned me on to, uh, thankfully, um, where he's showing that all these ancient alignments with these different places around the world, that, that the big mountains nearby are related through these geometric relation triangles, and that they're related to, in this way to the stars, and that right now between 2000 and 2100, all those stars are aligning with the highest mountains on Earth, which are in re also closest to the ancient sites that are related. It's a co complex thing. But you should track him down and have a chat with him sometime because that's, I've never been fully, I, I understand what he's getting at, but I haven't been able to put the thing into soundbite uh, where sure. I can explain it yet. Sure. Yeah. A lot How are you doing? Do you need this a break? Is, uh, you good? Oh, no, no, we're getting, um, yeah, yeah, might as well. We'll just roll. I want to take a break so I can stamp and stretch and then we'll maybe do some questions, answers, discussion if you want however you want to go. Sacred Geometry of the June 21st, 2000, or 2020. So this is coming up. I found this on Graham Hancock's site. Um, so there's the uh, link down at the bottom. We can find, you can find a bit more. So this is a big one. It starts kind of at Stonehenge and goes across Asia. You know, so uh, you know, pyramids, Kailash, Stonehenge, everything. Um, so we're still in this era of these alignments. I mean, what does it all mean? What does it have to do? And um, yeah, well, here's, here's another picture of that alignment. St. Christopher carrying Christ child across the river. Here's, here's a pure reflection of Orion in the handshake position, right? Because how is this stuff reflected in art and consciousness as we go through? So um, look at the, Samuel Putman, he said, the great art of each age has been the accurate reflection of the rhythm of that age, while the greatest art is always that which is in accord with the rhythm of absolute time, of the universal. And uh, I always loved Turner's work, right, because he was into Goethe's theory um, and expressed it all so well. I feel he really, really caught that higher sense of the interplay of light and darkness. Um, his a snowstorm steamboat off a harbor's mouth beautiful painting. Um, but then um, Aristotle said, the aim of art is to represent not the outward appearance of things, but their inward significance. So, yeah, when I was young, my dad, he was a professor, he was chair of the economics, or chair of the commerce down at uh, DePaul University in downtown Chicago. So those, so I grew up in that environment. And um, oh, he had a post office over here you know, a couple blocks away, we'd walk over there. I used to love it. It's what a magnificent building. That was one of the highlights when I was a kid. I wanted to go to the post office with my dad. It's just absolutely amazing. You know, it was a, it was a gem of the true Masonic arts. You know, it's, um, you know, vaulted dome, fluted pillars, marble floors, you know, organic shapes of 
true architecture. So yeah, in the 60s, they tore it down. They put this crap up. Mies van der Rohe tells, oh yeah, it's just a study in geometric perfection. It's a fucking box, excuse my French. Um, <laughs> I, and then I, they put up this calder, and they call it art. I don't know. I mean, to me, the thing that calder looked more like, um, I thought, what the city would look like after a nuclear explosion. <laughs> Wreckage. Um, so, yeah, it's called a flamingo, but, yeah, maybe it's hiding its head because of the ugliness it was starting to, uh, you know. But is, was calder good art? Was it bad art? You know, it... Did he actually catch the zeitgeist at the time? This was a changeover. This was actually the federal takeover of the states happened and people didn't notice this because people were asleep and, and they were being fooled by the papers and everything. <clears throat> so this is when the common law states like Illinois and California were changed to the federal zones like IL 60666 and CA 95589. Like people don't know a zip code. Put your zip code on the mail, zip the mail, go look the zip code up. You know what the zip code is? It's the zoning improvement plan for federal employees. It's voluntary. It's only need to, it's used this really this what this stuff runs deep. Um but anyway, but this all happened and they were tearing down the old stuff. So what at what level of the universe was this stuff actually functioning at? It really has to make you wonder, you know, is this um anyway, um I think his called his art is probably good and bad art. You know, it's it's good art because it was catching a bit of the time, it's bad art because uh, times are degenerating, you know. Um, so, you know, these understand they, it begs for a new impulse, you know, understanding the true nature of art, the nature of space, and ourselves at the same time. You know, we're not insignificant. If you know, you'll say, Oh, yeah, we're so insignificant. I go to who? And they go, Oh, the big picture. I go, We have big pictures in your head, right? Who are you really insignificant to? The elite that got you that picture? That's <laughs> don't be fooled. Fool, fool, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Right? <laughs> We're the centers of our own biological universes. When we die, we pass into the Bardo realms. What do we take with us? Some model that the scientists tried to convince us out of some experiments that we never actually saw and was only their interpretation, or our experiential reality. Exactly. That's, yeah. Um, so we thought, thus we are unable to envision. Envisage paralleling the historic evolution of the mind of man, succession of the different phases of the spatial problem in art, a succession which we may divide into three stages. First, the empiric period from prehistoric times down to the Italian Renaissance. The second, the optic or rationalistic period from the Renaissance to the advent of Cubism. And third, the synthetic or spiritual period from Cubism on. Well, the empiric period, we know that there was obviously from anybody who found magic Egypt knows there's a far deeper thing to this. He's speaking in a general term from a general understanding of Western history and stuff and what would have been known about the general stuff about the art at the time. I, I put the picture of Thoth in there because I like this relationship to the Kandinsky and the flow. Yes. But, um, but, but even if we don't agree with it, and this is from um, Leopold Servage's kind of, you know, ideas on spatial problem in painting. This is from Samuel Putnam, book, The Glistening Bridge, which can be downloaded uh, at the Center for Visual Music. Oh, excuse me. Bless you, darling. Yeah, you you excuse me for one second. <laughs> Guys, I hope you're enjoying this. This is um, pretty amazing, very thorough presentation <laughs> yeah no, no. i just got back from china and uh, yeah, i yeah i must have caught a little bit of a cold on the plane which i really get there but anyway thank you for putting up with me um yeah and okay so let's think of this even if he's not thoroughly accurate in these three phases because the first the empiric phase would be much more complex and we know there's a lot happening but definitely he got he caught the um what we call the optical or rationalistic period the Renaissance, that's for sure. And we can see that that was tied in directly with solar cycles. And um, then we got the, um, you know, the synthetic or spiritual period from Cubism on. And of course, we see at the beginning of that, these people, they were trying, Kandinsky, he was trying to create a language of art and uh, of basically shape and um, uh, what we call shape and color. 
that was basically, you know, express the artist's inner necessity, you know, communicate universal emotions, ideas, spirituality, like musicians do. He was trying to create this parallel with that. So, and he was into anthroposophy too. So even though it wasn't overt in his stuff. And, um, and he said, of all the arts, abstract painting is the most difficult. It demands that you know how to draw well, that you have a heightened sensitivity for composition and for colors, and that you be a true poet. The last is this the beginning of non-objective arts. And I also want to mention too, this um, Van Gogh painting, um, Starry Night. He painted that when he was at his most mentally disturbed after he cut his ear off, right? He's in a mental institution, right? And, and what they found out is these scientists actually found out by, through studying this and doing computer analysis of the you know, highlights that his Eddie's matched what they call the Kalmogora statistical model of turbulence. That he was actually seeing this, even though it's it the lame ambulance is generally considered the last unsolved mystery of classical physics. You know, so it's very possible that his mind, you know, worked by the so-called psychotic state. He was seeing this higher thing, but it's fine art. So where, where does this artistic impulse come from? You know, what was, what was Kandinsky trying to get in? What, you know, what were the Egyptians doing? I mean, I'm blown away by the information that, you know, Chance and um, everybody else has brought out in, you know, these series, this latest series on, the parts of the brain, and I, I'm still fathoming all that. There's so much, you know, so much to take in. And then here again from the Glistening Bridge, space then is the rhythm of our age. The space version superseding the woman version of the Renaissance is the nearest akin to the matter version of the 11th and 12th centuries. In this recapture of rhythm, we find ourselves in accord with the religious tradition, not only of the Middle Ages, but of the East. Our joint heritage is found to be rhythm and space later bequeathed us by the Renaissance, the picture having stepped down from the rhythmic wall, space having become the entity that has to be dominated. Dominated is an obscure word, which basically means to be tamed. So, so according to Servet, all the non-objective art is an attempt to paint what he calls the virgin of space, the rhythm of our time. You reflect in the awakening, the new understanding of space and time in, in the conventional world, you know? So you know, basically, we need to evolve our space. So you know, uh, and obviously, space, as we've seen from the Notre Dame cathedrals, is, is the Virgin Mary, you know, the, the black goddess of space, the, the mother, which um, whose womb is the um, center of the galaxy, the pleroma, and not a black hole, but um, we could say a generative plasma, which gives birth to higher life, the realm of the Aeons, the Aeon Sophia, who created us. And that's what 2012 was, right? The, the December solstice going through, these connections are happening. So much to it. I'm going to keep on rolling here. Um, but then what happened? Modern art was a CIA wet. Wait a minute. I thought this objective art was this new spiritual phase. It got hijacked pretty quick. Um, for decades in art circles, either rumor or a joke, but it is now confirmed as a fact that Central Intelligence Agency used modern art, including the works of artists such as Jackson Pollock, Robert Motherwell, Willem de Kooning, and Mark Rothko as a weapon in the Cold War in the manner of a Renaissance prince, except that it acted secretly. The CIA fostered and promoted American abstract painting around the world for more than 20 years. As we know, CIA is just a tool of the elite who created them. It goes back, I found this wonderful article years ago, Money, Power, and Modern Art by Henry C.K. Leo, a merchant banker in New York. And there's the web page, anybody want, I would highly recommend reading this. Um, he gets into the whole formation of the Federal Reserve and all that, and how you know, the women in the families were like supporting the artists and all that. And, and they did, they manipulated art. So same, exact same people that stopped Tesla, stopped all the higher technology, put this, form of modern art. They stopped all the organic processes of this development and promoted that, which they witched, which they liked. I mean, sure, Jackson Pollock, I wish he had, I had one, I'd sell it for 40 million and fund all my friend's projects, you know, because some idiot would buy it. Um, but look at these paintings. I mean, <laughs> you know, de Kooning and Motherwell, I mean, this is, this is uh, I'm you can't with you. call this art. I'm it's with you. design. 
Yeah. Uh, it's design. And, and I mean, I like some of that stuff. And, you know, I mean, I was sort of raised liking it. I like surrealism, but obviously, you know, there's a lot more to it. So, But in terms of lifting you better. up, in terms of reflecting the underlying theme of our time, unless it is, unless our time is this big, messy blotch, which it very well could be. Right. There is a mixture. I mean, this, that's to say, is it good art or bad art or both? You know, there's a bit of both in there. I mean, in some ways, I actually like this stuff. I mean, it's really cool in a sense. I like the abstract outre sort of far out world, you know. Hang on, I missed the beatnik world, but I got the hippie one. Um, <laughs> not that it really was, but um, anyway, um, people think you're artists because you got long hair. So anyway, we see the manipulation. So where does that really take us is, um, you know, Come to understand that great core within you, like the very axis around which the stars turn. And uh, I don't know if you noticed that, but the stars have been turning around these pictures all the way through. So, so in my sense, everybody takes it in their different way. You know, some people latch on to the um, science or particular strains of things, and they do it. So, in me, my my representation of the higher field and what we call the imaginal realm or the connection basically came through. Um, the Vajrayana um, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. I was talking about, you know, when I was a teenager, like the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. But I really liked it. You know, um, to, basically, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, you know, we meet what we call the Buddhas, right? The, um, the Dhyani Buddhas, which aren't really Buddhas. The aspects of consciousness form. Uh, perception, cognition, volition, and total consciousness all together. But, and these are representative of wisdoms. And that's what the mandala meditation is basically visualizing this thing as a complex thing. So, I mean, this is, but for me, I, I had to merge all the systems. I was trying to synthesize them. So I took Steiner's etheric sciences, which had very real basis in things. I worked with Trevor Constable, the weather engineer. We were in engineering large-scale weather changes using tiny geometric devices um, based on etheric technology. And um, Goethe's theory of color. So this is my reformation of the Vajri Ma Vajrayana Mandala for my own. And of course, I had to turn it around because I'm in the Southern Hemisphere because all that. Um, so basically, you know, the so the same Bogakai, the middle realm, body of limitless form. So in the sectors are like land or Buddha fields. And so we've got the Dharmakaya, which is the absolute, everything comes from. That's like the Pleroma. Then there's the Nirmanakaya, that's sort of the physical body, but really only when it's in touch with the illumined nature of that which projects onto this plane, like we say sacred geometry or something like coming out of the Platonic realm or something and then the Sambhogakaya that's this intermediate realm the bardo in essence so um, in the center of this then right we have this so the mandalas are more like metaphysical bullet points yantras are sort of like radionic devices this is sort of an extension of both which is Goethe's theory of color and the mandala unfolding into everything but then I put this in because out of this then Get Robleski in his Art Alphabet. Um, he was a theosophist. This came out in probably the 30s. And he was, this is again seminal in some of my um, formative years, was uh, he developed this language of art based on reading nature. So basically, you know, if we look at where, where are the basis, so this is what I've been working is trying to develop a, a language of art which comes out of all of this. Um, because in art, where do we see things? So let's say, here's the Tibetan Book of the Dead, right? Here's the, the peaceful deities. So basically, this is the mandala, right? You see the same pattern. So here's, here's the center, Narochana, Akshobhya, uh, Ratnasambhava, Amitabha, and uh, Amoga Siddhi, right? So the four... So basically, you got the five. Whatever the attendant ones are around, that doesn't really matter. You're looking at the pure form here. You see it. That, that's what it is. And so this is art. It's not religious art in the Western sense, um, where you're looking at something to be pious or, you know, just a, this is a map. 
this is the map of the Bardos. This is telling you, this is, you remember this one, you're going to figure your way through. Um, and this is then the wrathful deities. And again, here you got, you know, Varrocha in this form, they've got given different names in these forms. And there's the basic five around. So basically, what I, the, the peaceful deities are the, um, is the mandala acting out of the heart chakra in our interactions with reality and people. And that's what the karmic path is, is in we got to like deal with these in the ungrounded state because these are the imprints. And then the crown chakra is, you know, the wrathful deities, the mandala functioning through that. And when I showed that six pointed star there, that is, you know, with the full color thing, because I always say in this, you know, when you're going through the bardos, well, if you didn't get it, and you connect the wisdom in this one, and you're moving on the next moment. Say, well, take refuge in the rainbow heart of the Buddha. But the rainbow heart of the Buddha is basically that six-pointed star. If you study the uh, Anahata chakra, in that sense. So this is sort of art science, because then like I say Goethe theory, color atmosphere, color formation, Tesla waves. They all type. So, I mean, I, I just really like working with archetypes and symbols. And one of the earliest, and I like this quote from Alejandro Jodorowsky, words are not the truth. They indicate the way to go, but you need to go alone in silence. Symbols have a language that surpass the words. It's one of the early practices I did when I was a teenager, um, got it out of probably Butler's Apprentice to Magic, but I've seen it in other places since then, was the Tatra Visions where you meditate on the tatras or the elements, which is basically the uh, Kalyoni is the 16 tatras here, earth, water from upper left, going down counterclockwise, earth, water of earth, air of earth, fire of earth, you know, earth of water, like this. And these are the 16 court cards of the tarot as well. Those are these same elements, or the, the kalas or emanations of Kali, which is where the calendar comes from. So this is, this is the calendar of now, right? The etheric weaving of which biological time spirals along on. And the center diagram is one of my um, symbolic solutions to Steiner's ethers in artistic form. So the red is the warmth ether, the blue is the tone ether pulling in those, and then we have what looks like the compass and square. That's the life ether, which is rooted to the most densest form, our skeleton, and you know, even we look at Reich's bion experiments and stuff will give us an understanding of that. And then the optical, which can transcend all of those and comes down and curious enough, this just popped in my head one day and there we have basically a compass in square. I know. As a fundamental of energetic formation in consciousness coming out of these archetypal realms. So the Yoni of Kali, that's the past and giving birth out of it is the future. So, I mean, if we look at what Kandinsky was going, right, he's saying, you know, basically turn from nature, go purely with the form. But I believe if we can go, get into Goethe's theory of metamorphoses of plants, that we can continue to bring these natural processes in and combine this whole sense of things. And um, so here we are at the beginning. This is uh, some visionary art by my friend Nemo. Papa Legba opening the gate, but Papa Legba is none other than the Christ returning. It's just different archetypes from different religions. Uh, love this, you know, getting off the cross of matter, which we can call the Nirmanakaya, right? Which is, you know, and, you know, and we're in this awakened heart, mind, body, you know, um, which is the Sambhogakaya, right? Stepping through into the Dharmakaya, realizing, so we can actually see those forms of enlightenment and reality around us because they're all functioning here right now. You know, that was the sixth patriarch, Huey Nang, right? We're all already enlightened. We just don't notice it. Right? We got to like understand how these things are. Um, you know, so it's all here. We just need real, it's a matter of orientation. And this symbol, basically, this is, we could call this the 20, era 2012 symbol, the, the sun being reborn into the new age coming through. So anyway, Beautiful. so hopefully this will be a new phase for people. And um, no, thank you for giving me the time, Denise. 
This is amazing, Thomas. Really, I mean, just absolutely, completely mind-blowing. And, and um, I appreciate you taking the time and really, really going through all of this with us. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to post this on YouTube too for anybody that missed the whole thing. Um, but I'll just see if there's any questions at all. For, oh, do you want a break, sweetie? Um, I'll see if there's any questions. Oh, maybe if we'll take 15, 20 minutes of questions okay. and I'm going to give up and go eat. Yes. I made my voice. I was losing my voice, but it came back, so I'm okay. <laughs> okay. I can do this. I don't care. There's so many trails that this could go off on. I mean, these are like stratifications. You can go and study the fossils at the different layers and stuff. So I was, I was trying to give an overview. I know it's amazing. Mind. Look, we'll have you back, and we'll go. We'll start going down some of these rabbit holes because um there is just so much information here. I think I'm gonna. It's gonna take me a while to digest just this. Um, my friend Truth Seeker wants to know, have you read The Last Star of Myth and Time by Walter Grutenden? And do you agree with his theory that we are in a solar binary with two suns, the other sun being the star Sirius and their movements causing heightened states of consciousness to humans on Earth? Absolutely. That was one of the slides I pulled out. I mean, that whole section on the alignments and all that, I had a number of other animated slides no, that's totally tied in, um, you know, with the serious cycle. Wonderful book. I really like Walter's work. There's, there's a lot to that. Um, so, yeah. Yes. That, that's integral to understanding this. So. Is that this? Okay, I, I, I had too many slides. I mean, this, I've got hundreds and hundreds of these slides. You know, it's like, <laughs> how do you do them? And how do you keep a consistent story and not get lost and just try to keep it in soundbite reality because it's a slide? <laughs> I know it's true. It's true. Look, I know Chance can't wait to get his hands on some of you with you and some of your slides and really kind of take some time because there's just so much important information here. But luckily, I think we we have uh, completely confounded everybody because we don't have any more questions at this point, darling. So I'm going to let you go, let you eat, post this on Facebook and YouTube, and say thank you, thank you so much, darling. Oh no! Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. And um, deadlines are wonderful. Give me another one sometime. <laughs> I absolutely will, John. That's a deal. Well, we're coming to see you to shoot you in November, so I'm really looking forward to well, that. And, right, and I thought, well, actually, I'll do this talk live when you come up here. That's a deal. Oh, that's a deal. <laughs> New Earth Haven venue here. I so can't wait. It looks gorgeous. I was looking at those um, rooms that you sent me. The, they look amazing. I can't wait to come out. I need a holiday. So this is going to be great. A working holiday. <laughs> that sounds good. Thank you Fantastic. so much, Venice. You have a wonderful day there. You too, Don. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.